Divers often say they fear decompression illness or getting bent, but often they don't really understand its causes, effects, or the conditions that signal a case of the bends. As well, many divers are very cautious about how they dive, making sure they remain conservative with their depths and times, while others take a much more cavalier attitude about their dive profiles. In reality, relatively few divers get into trouble, although higher risk diving should be avoided to minimize the likelihood of decompression illness. So, how is it that a diver can make essentially the same dive 10 times and then exhibit symptoms of decompression illness on the 11th? Or how can two divers make essentially the same dive and one walk away fine while the other goes to the hospital? Basically, there are any number of variables, some we understand and some we do not, that determine our body's reaction to nitrogen and other inert gases building up in the body tissues. During a dive, body tissues absorb nitrogen from the breathing gas. Your body can't do anything with the inert nitrogen, as it does with oxygen, which is used by our metabolism. So, the nitrogen, or other inert breathing gas, is simply stored in the blood and body tissues. As you go deeper, you absorb nitrogen faster and can absorb more of it. Eventually, the pressure inside the body reaches equilibrium with the surrounding pressure, and no more nitrogen can be absorbed. As long as you remain at the same depth, the gas in your body presents no problem. If you descend, your body will begin absorbing more nitrogen until it eventually equalizes again. In general, though, most divers never dive long enough to fully saturate any body tissues, or only those that are known to absorb gas very fast. When you ascend, the pressure on your body decreases, and the nitrogen should come out of solution and be exhaled via the lungs. If the decompression rate, however, exceeds a critical limit, instead of diffusing through the lungs, the gas can come out of solution in the blood and tissues and form bubbles in the tissues and bloodstream. The human body can tolerate a certain amount of what is known as supersaturation. This means the partial pressure of nitrogen in your body is higher than the ambient pressure. As long as the tissue supersaturation doesn't become too extreme, your body processes the gas normally, removing it from the body through the lungs where it is exhaled normally. That's the basic explanation. Obviously, there is a lot more going on. Dive tables and dive computers are based on mathematical models. These models assume that some tissues will absorb nitrogen faster than others. Blood, for example, is regarded as a fast tissue. It will be saturated with inert gas very quickly. Bone, on the other hand, is a slow tissue, absorbing nitrogen very slowly and thus taking a very long time to saturate. Tissues like muscle, fat, and the brain and spinal cord will absorb nitrogen at different rates. However, these human models are completely theoretical. There's no way of knowing how fast these tissues actually absorb nitrogen or release it. And those times would change based on the dive in question and factors like exercise, body temperature, fitness and hydration, among others. Dive tables and computers use algorithms, which are sets of mathematical formulae, to estimate the time a diver can stay at a certain depth. But it's just an estimate. Some of the mathematical models behind these devices have been tested to some extent, but not all of them. It's important to realize that the science behind these is inexact, and there are substantial limitations to their ability to predict what is actually happening within our bodies. This should be apparent by the fact that any two divers, irrespective of differences in gender, race, body fat percentage, level of hydration, or any other factors, 
would be allowed to do the same dive on a computer or a diving table based on the algorithm, common sense would tell us that this is simply not true, not even for the same individual with the same physiological changes from day to day and even within a single day. Tables and computers are adjusted to allow for greater nitrogen uptake in deeper, shorter dives and longer, shallower ones and which tissues are affected. Still, there is a tremendous amount of individual variability. Look at the people on either side of you. You don't look alike. You don't have the same body or body makeup. There's no way that a set of tables or a dive computer will absolutely work for every person. While millions of dives are performed every year, safely and with relatively few incidents, it's important to remember that tables and computers cannot say with certainty that you can make a dive and not have trouble afterwards. There is a certain level of risk that comes with every dive, even dives that fall well within the table or limits indicated by the computer. In diving, we often talk about decompression illness. You will also hear this referred to as DCI. DCI is a blanket term used to encompass both decompression sickness, or DCS, and arterial gas embolism, or AGE. The mechanisms for these two diving injuries are very different, but the same first aid and treatment is used for both. Regardless of whether a diver has DCS or AGE, oxygen first aid and recompression in a hyperbaric chamber exposure is the prescribed management. The following discussion will describe both of the manifestations of DCI, their causes, and how to care for them. So, what is decompression sickness? And what happens in the body when you do have to deal with it? Scientists generally agree that bubbles forming in or near joints cause the joint pain. Bubbles pressing on nerves can cause numbness and tingling, which are common symptoms in recreational diving. More serious manifestations, such as paralysis, can be caused by bubbles in the spinal cord or brain. There is a lot we don't know about decompression sickness, though, in spite of many years of study. The theory holds that nitrogen in the blood or body tissues forms bubbles when divers surface following a dive. There is evidence that bubbles in the blood commonly occur after diving. These bubbles usually cause no problems and are typically filtered out by the small blood vessels in the lungs where the gas is eventually exhaled. Bubbles in the body cause a problem when they grow so large and or there are so many that they cannot travel throughout the smaller blood vessels in the body. They can get caught at choke points such as joints. These bubbles can block blood flow, causing trauma to the body tissues, either from the bubble itself or from the lack of blood supply to the downstream tissues. Either way, this manifests itself as the joint pain that makes up the traditional bend. The name itself is thought to come from the position caisson workers took after spending time in pressurized work compartments. They would return to the surface and would walk doubled over in a bend to account for the pain. Bubbles can also get trapped in and distort body tissues and exert pressure on nerves, causing symptoms of DCS. Bubbles passing through blood vessels can cause damage to the delicate walls of these vessels and cause leakage and certain chemical changes within the blood, triggering clotting and other mechanisms that can cause symptoms. Symptoms of decompression illness can come on quickly or can take as long as 24 hours to develop, especially when you ascend to altitude following the dive by driving up a mountain or flying in an airplane. Most symptoms of decompression sickness appear within six hours of the dive. There are many different symptoms of decompression sickness. The three most common symptoms include pain, numbness and tingling, and muscle weakness. Pain is the most commonly reported symptom, but numbness and tingling is common and too often ignored.
Arterial gas embolism, also known as air embolism or cerebral arterial gas embolism, but most commonly referred to as AGE, also involves a bubble in the bloodstream. The mechanism for the creation of that bubble is totally different, however. An arterial gas embolism happens when a diver suffers a lung overexpansion injury involving an adjacent blood vessel, causing air to enter the bloodstream. Lung barotrauma is discussed in greater detail in the section on barotrauma. This air then follows the normal pathway of the blood to the heart and is often pumped to the rest of the body via the arterial circulation. Because the greatest percentage of the blood pumped by the heart is to supply the vital organs, the bubbles are commonly pumped to these organs, such as the brain and the heart. When a gas bubble is pumped to the brain, it blocks blood flow and thus the supply of oxygen to the tissue, causing both tissue damage and damage to the cerebral blood vessels. Because the gas embolism is acting similarly to a blood clot, thromboembolism, it causes similar stroke-like neurological symptoms, including loss of consciousness and paralysis, among others. These signs and symptoms typically appear very soon after resurfacing, usually within 20 minutes or so, but often immediately. They also tend to be dramatic, although this is not always the case. The tingling? I think it's from the dive? Approximately 80% of all recreational dive accidents involve neurological symptoms. There are symptoms that include numbness and weakness, but also include paralysis or death. Scientists generally believe that the way recreational divers dive contributes to this. Most dive injuries involving Navy and commercial divers are what is known as pain-only DCS. This is just joint pain. These divers dive often to a single depth for a conservatively planned period while they are working and then very slowly decompress their way back to the surface. They are also diving much more regularly, which means that the slower tissues, like bones and tendons, may not be totally free from inert gas when the next dive starts, and this then builds up over time until it presents as pain-only bends. Recreational divers, on the other hand, often dive deeper, but they do so much more quickly. And they also ascend more rapidly and commonly do repetitive diving, often with relatively short surface intervals. In the case of neurological symptoms, a bubble has likely formed in the spinal cord, or bubbles have disrupted the blood supply to or from the spinal cord. This bubble can interfere with the nerves' interactions or physically put pressure on the cord. Anytime neurological symptoms appear in a diver, the situation is serious and it requires immediate oxygen first aid, followed by prompt treatment in a recompression chamber. Any time you believe a diver has been injured in a dive accident and is exhibiting symptoms of decompression illness, your immediate first aid should be to deliver as close to 100% oxygen first aid as possible. You learned about this during the Dan Oxygen First Aid for Scuba Diving Injuries course. Your next step is to call Dan and set the process in motion to get the diver to a hyperbaric chamber. There's a lot of misconception with regards to recompression chambers and hyperbaric treatment. Hyperbaric literally means high or raised pressure. In a dive accident, the diver is placed inside of the chamber and the pressure inside is raised to a typical treatment depth of 60 feet or 18 meters. The chamber is usually pressurized with normal air. At this depth, the diver breathes 100% oxygen through a mask or hood tent. Breathing 100% oxygen at that depth is the equivalent of breathing 280% oxygen due to the effect of partial pressure. 
The pressure itself has the ability to reduce the volume of bubbles inside the diver's body to about one-third of the original size. This reduced volume often helps the bubble return to solution, or at least move further down the bloodstream in the body. By moving the bubble further along, it helps to minimize the blood flow interruptions and get oxygen to tissues that have been oxygen deprived. Additionally, the body is always attempting to gain an equilibrium with gases, moving them from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. A nitrogen bubble in the body is obviously an area of high nitrogen concentration. By having the diver breathing 100% oxygen while under pressure, the oxygen concentration in the body increases. The body attempts to gain equilibrium in the gases by moving oxygen into the bubble and moving nitrogen out. Taking advantage of this pressure differential is commonly referred to as the oxygen window. There are many treatment tables that can be used to treat divers, but the U.S. Navy Treatment Table 6 is by far the most common. A Table 6 begins with a return to 60 feet, 18 meters of pressure, with the diver breathing 100% oxygen. After 20 minutes on oxygen, the diver breathes air for five minutes and then returns to oxygen. After three cycles of oxygen and air, the pressure in the chamber is reduced to the equivalent of 30 feet, 9 meters, where the diver spends 15 minutes on air, followed by an hour on oxygen, a second 15-minute air break, another 60 minutes on oxygen, and then a third 15-minute air break. At the end, the chamber is returned to surface pressure with the diver and the tender inside the chamber both on oxygen. These treatment tables can be repeated multiple times, although most of the time a diver will only go through one or two Table 6 treatments. Occasionally, they will then go through follow-up treatments with shorter tables to reduce any further residual symptoms. Even when you do everything right, there is always the possibility of getting DCS, and lung barrow trauma with arterial gas embolism can happen in water as shallow as 4 feet or 1.5 meters. You can reduce the risk of getting DCI by not diving if you are unwell, staying well within the limits of your dive tables or dive computer, making slow, safe ascents, doing safety stops, staying well hydrated, and getting plenty of rest before and after a dive. You should also avoid exercising after a dive and ascending to altitude following a dive, whether on the road or in an aircraft. Even pressurized aircraft are typically only pressurized to between 6,000 and 8,000 feet. That is more than enough altitude to cause you to have a problem. The only way to completely remove your risk of decompression illness is to avoid diving altogether. Assuming that isn't an option, there will always be some risk to diving.